Hi guys, Sam here. Today we're going to talk about defiled garments. This is an issue that shows up in Scripture in both the Old and the New Testament. Uh, and Jesus uh, speaks about it repeatedly, but you don't hear it preached much, if at all, in the churches today. So we're going to talk about it. Uh, it's very, very important. What is the garment? What are we supposed to do with it? Um, why does it matter? And how does it relate to our salvation and our success on Judgment Day? So let's just get right into it. Um, I did a search on all the scriptures about uh, robes and garments, and I'm going to give those to you. Um, and if you want to test everything, by all means, do a, do a search as well and, and check this out. Um, but here we go. Our first scripture is Isaiah 61.10. It says, He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. It's such a gorgeous statement. You know, the book of Isaiah is so amazing. So interesting, though. The, 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 Isaiah is saying, He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He's covered me with the robe of righteousness. Um, our next verse, uh, Ecclesiastes 9, 8, says, Let thy garment always be white, and let thy head lack no ointment. Um, this is a brief verse, but, but it's important on two factors here. Now, one of them is, uh, it says, Let thy garment always be white, which indicates that it's possible for it to not always be white. And also, let thy head lack no ointment. And we, know, we see ointment and oil likened unto the Holy Spirit uh, throughout Scripture. So, uh, that's relevant here when uh, Ecclesiastes is telling us to let our garments always be white and let our head lack no ointment. So let's keep going. Uh, Job 29, 14 says, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My judgment was as a robe. And it's so interesting, these Old Testament verses. Uh, let's take a look real quick at uh, Psalm 104, uh, verse 2. It says, the Lord wraps himself in light as a garment. Uh, which is it's fascinating. It's he's it's, he's clothed in light, and, um, and and what it looks like here is when when he says he's clothed me with the garments of salvation, that these garments are made out of light, and there there's some more verses here to to uh, to support that. So let's let's keep going with it. But very interesting, our robes being made of light uh, that the Lord gave us. Uh, so next verse is Jude 23. So we're over to the New Testament now. Uh, we'll start here with this first one, Jude 23. Some save with compassion, others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. And it's worth noting real quick, uh, it, when it says some save with compassion, others save with fear, uh, there's a time and a place for both of those things. You know, if you're ministering to someone that's heartbroken, uh, you know, love and mercy and compassion is the name of the game. And, and I'm all for, you know, love and mercy and compassion. But then it says others save with fear. You know, indicating that somebody that is rebellious and stiff-necked and hard-hearted, maybe they need the fear of God, right? They need to be—they uh, need to fear God and stop being that way and stop being st stiff-necked. So there's a time and place for both those things, you know, fire and brimstone as well. And uh, not a good idea to just throw that out the window, you know, the fear of God. <laughs> you know, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, you know, so let's not, uh, let's not get rid of that and only do the love and mercy stuff because sometimes people need to fear God. So, so, but let's go back here. Uh, some save with compassion, others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now, the, the, the garment spotted by the flesh? Is it possible that this garment that the Lord has given you when he forgave your sins and made you a new creature, uh, is it possible uh, for this garment to be spotted by the flesh? This is the book of Jude in the New Testament. Jude says, um, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. And well, let's look at the book of James here because he speaks on this too. Uh, James 1.27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted by the world. Now, that's, now check that, unspotted by the world. In fact, some translations say unstained by the world. And that ties right in with what Jude 23 is saying about uh, the garment that's spotted by the flesh. Um, the world and the flesh is sinful. The flesh, or the world is sinful. We know the whole world lies in wickedness, right? That's First John, and uh, we know the flesh is corrupt and sinful. You know, the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. So, um, the, these two verses are saying that the flesh and the world, and the things of it, will stain you, and will spot your garment, or stain your garment, or you could say defile your garment. Uh, and that's a huge problem. So, but let's, James, let's look a little more. James 127, pure religion. If you want to be pure um, and undefiled before God, pure and undefiled before God is this, 
help the widows and orphans, and keep yourself unstained by the world. It's that, it's actually that easy. That's just what God's looking for. This is, that's the key. That's what he is looking for. But are you, are we keeping ourselves unstained by the world? Are you keeping your garment unstained? How, how is your garment? Uh, maybe we ought to be asking the Lord, how is my garment, Lord? Is, is, is it dirty? Is there anything that needs to be cleansed? So let's keep going. There's lots more verses about the garment. This next one is uh, Revelation 16, 15. This is Jesus speaking these are some of his final words to his churches. He says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, that's just really important. Jesus says, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garment. Jesus is telling you and I to keep your garment clean, which is uh, exactly what, you know, Jude is pointing to. Uh, or James is saying, keep yourself unstained by the world. And, and uh, Jude is talking about your garment being stained by the flesh. Jesus is saying, you need to keep your garment clean. Now, even Paul says, you need to keep yourself pure. He says, you keep yourself pure he doesn't say well you're pure no matter what you do and don't worry about it and god's just going to take care of everything and and all that he's saying you you keep yourself pure if you have the holy spirit and you got the scriptures in front of you knowing what the right things are to do and what the wrong things are we're not supposed to do he's saying you keep yourself pure keep yourself unspotted by the world and, and, and unstained by the flesh paul says keep yourself pure uh so uh, and Jesus right here is saying, keep your garment clean and keep watch. And this is something that pops up again and again. Keep watch. Keep watch for Jesus. Keep watch. We need to be watching out for him. Uh, and this is a, this is a, an important point. And Adam and Eve, when they uh, when they're in the garden, right, and they're uh, they they sinned, right? They 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 ate the fruit. And as soon as they ate the fruit and committed the sin, they realized they were naked. Were Adam and Eve clothed in light? Were they wearing robes of garments of salvation, just like it's talking here, and they were clothed in light? And once they did the sin there and ate the fruit, uh, they realized they were suddenly naked and they were ashamed, right? They had to get the fig leaves or whatever because they were ashamed because they realized they were naked. That's what the sin did for them. It, uh, their, their light, well, you know, whatever, if they were clothed in light and it went out because of the sin, that's how they realize they're naked and ashamed. Jesus is saying right here, you need to keep your garment clean so that, uh, you know, so that you don't end up walking naked and, and, and you know, your shame is revealed. So um, in the same way that Adam and Eve were supposed to not eat the fruit, you and I are supposed to not do the sins. Am I right? Um, so... Uh, but one of the interesting points here with this is that it is possible to defile your garment. We know that when you get saved and get your sins forgiven and made a new creature and get the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus gives you uh, this holy garment, garments of salvation, Isaiah says. But um, and and you can't you can't earn it, right? You can't buy it. You can't earn. You can't buy the Holy Spirit or any of that. But he's saying once you do get that free gift, it's a free gift. But once you do get it, we're supposed to keep it clean. You keep your garment clean. You keep yourself pure because it's indicating here that it is possible to defile your garment. So let's keep going with the scriptures. There's more. Um, Jesus, this is Jesus again. Matthew 22. Um, Jesus is talking, and he says, uh, when the king. Came, this is at the wedding supper, right? The wedding supper of the Lamb. When the king came in to see the guests. He saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in here not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Isn't that interesting? That you know, Was this guy without a garment, was he called but not chosen? He, he was in there, he was at the wedding, but he, you know, he spotted without the garment. And is he naked and ashamed? They bind him hand and foot and throw him in outer darkness? That's, he's not going to, you don't get to go to the wedding supper. You can't go to the wedding supper without your wedding garment. Okay, so we're supposed to keep our garment clean, right? We're the, we're the spotless bride. Now, and now, how many spots and blemishes is a spotless bride allowed to have? How much filth and defiling and stuff like that uh, is okay in your life? You know, on, on your garment. I, I would say none. We need to, you know, uh, Paul says, awake to righteousness and sin not. He says, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And I think he means it, right? He says, keep yourself pure. So, um, uh, and it's interesting, this is, uh, you know, the 10 virgins. This is right here. Um, if you keep reading in Matthew right there, you'll get right to the story of the 10 virgins where, uh, uh, 
you know, he says many are called, but few are chosen. It sounds like there's 10 of them that are called, but uh, only five of them are chosen. Only five of them go in with the bridegroom. And it's interesting because with the 10 virgins, uh, they're all pure. They're pure virgins waiting on the bridegroom, which of course is Jesus. So they're pure virgins waiting on the bridegroom and they had oil, but they didn't have enough oil. And suddenly the bridegroom shows up and, you know, five of them just, they don't have the oil. They don't have the light. They don't have the garment. And so they've got to go and try and, you know, try and fix the problem. And the, the five wise virgins go in with the bridegroom and the door is shut. And the other ones come back saying, hey, let us in too. And he says, I know you're not, you worker of iniquity. I know you're not. I know not from whence you came. Now, we can't have that happen to you. What if that happens? These these five virgins that get, that get they strike out and are rejected, they were waiting on Jesus. They were pure, they were purified, they're virgins, and they're waiting on the Lord, Jesus, the bridegroom, and they, uh, but when he shows up, they weren't ready, and they're rejected. So uh, it's a huge problem. We don't want to show up with a garment that is, uh, that's darkened or, or defiled or, or absent. I mean, you don't want darkness. What, what communion has light with darkness? None. None. So uh, we don't want to have any kind of darkness or stain or sin or defilement of, of any kind, no spot or blemish on our garment, which it is possible to defile by doing sins. So uh, let's keep going. Revelation 3, 4 says, Thou hast a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Uh, what happened to the rest of the names in Sardis? You catch what he's saying right here? He's saying you have a few names in Sardis that have not defiled their garments. This is Jesus in a letter to his church well after the apostles have, uh, you know, done their job. Um, he's in, So the church is spreading. He's in, to the, the names in Sardis is to the Jesus' words to his followers in Sardis. He's saying you have a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. They will walk with me in white for they are worthy. The rest of the names in Sardis have defiled their garments and they will not walk with jesus in white and they're not worthy they went back to the world they backslid and uh and they're going to go to hell they're not going to walk with jesus in white and they're not worthy when the lord jesus is saying they are not worthy that's a huge problem what if he said that about you what if he said that about me that's that should terrify us all shouldn't it it really should um now, some people say when it comes to backsliding, they say, oh, so you're Mr. Perfect. First of all, I'm not perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. And uh, if you're not as perfect as Jesus, you're not perfect. Um, but we're supposed to be keeping ourselves pure, striving for perfection. Paul said, not that I had already attained, neither were already perfect, but I've, I as follow after. I'm striving after, right? He's striving for that perfection. He's 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 uh, striving for it. So, uh, But some people with, with backsliding, they say, oh, well, you, you must be perfect. Like, So you're saying the slightest thing. Let's say I, uh, I'm i doing good and I walk with Jesus my whole life, but then I run a stop sign, right? I break a traffic law, I run the stop sign, boom, I get killed in a car accident and I go to hell. I live my whole life for Jesus, but I did this one little thing wrong and I didn't get a chance to repent. And so, boom, I go to hell. But that's not quite really the right thing. That's not how it goes because um, backsliding starts in the heart, right? And it starts in little ways, in little compromises. You can be, you know, white hot for God and on fire for God and everything, but then, uh, you know... You, you, you slack off a little bit. You become lukewarm. You might say, well, you know, I'm going to go ahead and watch this movie. I mean, the Holy Spirit hates this movie, and they blaspheme the Lord in it, but I'm going to go ahead and watch it, you know, have a little entertainment. Now, I mean, there's murder, adultery, and stuff in there. It's, you know, I'll watch the movie, though. I love Jesus, but I'm going to watch the filth movie. Next thing you know, well, maybe you're hanging out with some uh, some ungodly people, some ungodly friends. You know, the next thing you know, you got some cuss words coming out of your mouth. Maybe you're, some ugly talk and stuff like that. You know, well, you'd say, well, that's fine. I'm saved by grace, saved by grace. But the thing is, you're uh, when you're on the narrow path, right? You got the, the cross of on your shoulder, your cross of self denial. Your day, you take up your cross daily and deny yourself, and you're following Jesus, and you're on the narrow path, and you start to backslide a little bit. It's it it kind of like I said, it comes in little compromises. You back backslide backslide and all of a sudden you're not on the narrow path anymore you're now you're on the wide road to destruction and you don't know it all right I, people are walking around right now with defiled garments and they don't know it and they think they're okay with jesus they think they're totally fine and their preacher and their pastor is lying to them and reassuring them you're safe you're safe you're safe no it's in the bag don't worry about it and everything you know predestined and you know whatever and sealed by the spirit and everything but uh but they're walking around with defiled garments because they don't live right 
and they're going to be a surprise. In fact, Jesus, he says repeatedly, there's people that are going to be surprised. So we'll, we'll get to that. Um, but if you've backslidden, you're back on the, the broad road to destruction. Okay, you're not on the narrow path anymore. And Proverbs 21, it says, uh, he who wanders out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. Okay, if you wander out of the way of understanding, which is to obey Jesus in every possible way at all times, then you remain in the congregation of the dead. And a lot of people say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a child of God. I, uh, I love Jesus. I got my sins forgiven. I got sealed by the Spirit and everything. I'm a child of God and nothing can change that and everything. But you better find out in 2 Peter where he talks about God's cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and gone astray. And if that's you, you got to fix that. Um, what if you're, you were God's child and you were a child of God, but then you forsook the right way and you went astray? Have you gone astray? Are you going around calling yourself a child of God, even though you have forsaken the right way and gone astray? Uh, in 1 John, it says, here's who, how you can tell who's the children of God and the children of the devil. Whoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. So if you doeth not righteousness because you're doing some fornication or you're doing some dishonesty and stuff like that, you're a child of the devil. You're not, you can't go around claiming Jesus Christ while you're doing filth and, and betraying him and disobeying him left and right and saying, well, I'm still a child of God anyway. You're, maybe what if you're God's cursed children with eyes full of adultery? who have forsaken the right way and gone astray. What if that's you? Peter's saying they're, they're out there. They're sit, in fact, he says in that same passage, he's saying they sit with you. They sit with you and they eat with you. Uh, if you actually check and, you know, like Paul says, if you have anyone that is called a brother uh, who is a fornicator or a drunkard or, a, you know, extortioner, like a dishonest guy or whatever like that, you don't even sit down to eat with that guy. And you, you don't, and he says, and put that wicked person away from among you. You don't let him in your group. You, that's a wolf among the sheep. And then he goes on and says other stuff, like any brother that walks disorderly, you, you, you depart from that guy. Uh, so, uh, you know, Peter's saying the same thing. We're sitting with these people. We're sitting with the wolves among the sheep. And the sheep, th these wolves think they're sheep. I don't know if you're going to call them goats or whatever you want, but they're, uh, they have defiled garments. And they're sitting with you. They defile their garments and everything and act like it's all right. Let's keep going. Okay, Revelation 6, 11 says, And white robes were given unto every one of them, which is consistent with even uh, from our first verses in Isaiah. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. And this verse here in Revelation 6, 11 saying, And white robes were given unto every one of them. This white robe, this garment, it's real. And I don't understand it exactly if it's made out of light or whatever. I, I don't I understand everything. You know, we see through the glass dimly and we don't have a, a full understanding of what's happening here. But this garment's real. It's made out of light. It's possible to defile it, to, to defile it and and uh, and make it filthy. And also uh, get this. It's possible to clean it. Your next verse. Uh, Revelation 714. These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. If you have a defiled garment, if the Lord's ringing your bell right now and letting you know you have a defiled garment and you're defiled before him, there's a solution for you. You can wash your robe in the blood of the lamb. And you better. And I'll tell you why. Because you get this this next verse. This is 1 Corinthians 3.17. Paul says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Uh, now, now, who can defile your temple? Is it possible? Uh, he says, the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. You know that you and I were the temple of the Holy Ghost, right? He says, um, if any man defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Is it possible for you to defile your own temple? Well, sure it is. Jesus says right here, he says, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of his mouth that defiles him. It's possible for you to defile yourself just with what's coming out of your mouth. And we can be very sure that you also de defile yourself if you're committing adultery and you're doing fornication and sexual sin right in front of him. It's right in front of him. Uh, I just want to tell you right now, on Judgment Day, it's going to be everyone according to the, their deeds, no respect of persons. There's no respect of persons with God. This comes up again and again. And Paul says in Colossians, he says, and every, he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong that he has done, and there's no respect of persons. Uh, 
If you're doing wrong, you're doing fornication and dishonesty and stuff like that. You're going to receive for that. And there, you can't go and like, well, I'm saved by grace. So I'm going to get some kind of special treatment. I mean, I act just like the heathens, but I'm not going to go where the heathens go. Yeah, you are actually. If you do as the heathens do, you're going to go where the heathens go. There's no respect of persons. You either obeyed Jesus or you didn't. And obeying Jesus isn't just believing. Okay, uh, the will of God isn't, sure, the will of God is that you believe on him that sent him and everything, but here the will of God is um, that you abstain from fornication and that you not defraud your brother in any matter, right? All dishonesty and all sexual sins got to go, and that's the will of God. You better get a hold of that. I mean, we, we've already covered James 1 where he says, this pure religion undefiled before God is this, help widows and orphans and keep yourself unstained by the world. That's what he is looking for. That's how to do it. If you want to be undefiled before God, that's it. Keep yourself unstained by the world. Uh, and, and, and this is an amazing thing to me. This is amazing because uh, when people talk about, well, they talk about election and predestination and, uh, you know, uh, past, present, and future sins all forgiven, which is actually not in the Bible. Your past sins are forgiven, right? Romans 3.25 and, and Peter mentions it too. But uh, there's no mention of actual your future sins are forgiven in advance. There's, there, that's not there. It's not there. You have to you have to squish it in there and try to make it in there when it's not really there. Um, but the amazing thing when people are doing that and they say, well, I'm sealed by the Spirit. I'm safe. I'm guaranteed. I'm sealed by the Spirit. I can't defile my garment. It's pure and wonderful and everything, no matter what I do and everything, because I'm sealed by the Spirit. But check it out. They forget about uh, when it says when Paul says, grieve not the Spirit. Okay, and quench not the Spirit. That's First Thessalonians. He says, quench not the Spirit by which you were sealed, right? Um, what if you, you know, you were sealed by the Spirit, and if you say you were, I believe you. Okay, I believe that you, if you got the Holy Spirit at some point, you asked Jesus to forgive you, great. But um, what if you grieve the Spirit and grieve the Spirit and quench the Spirit? You were sealed with Him, but now you've quenched Him? You were sealed by the Holy Spirit, and now you've grieved Him and grieved Him to the point you've quenched Him? And you think you're just going to slip through the narrow gate that way? Everything's going to be all right? You've quenched him by doing sins, by doing filth right in front of God. Everything's being recorded, and everything's going to get played back on your judgment day, okay? Now, and this, here's the next verse about it, with the Holy Spirit and everything. Hebrews 10, 29 says, Of how much worse punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who has trodden underfoot the Son of God, and has counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing and has done despite unto the spirit of grace listen if you were sanctified you the count of the blood of the covenant which wherewith you were sanctified but now you're doing despite to the spirit of grace it says how much worse punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy of and we better take a look right here jesus says that servant you know, which knew his lord's will not the lord his Lord, he knew his Lord's will, but he did not prepare himself, neither did he according to his Lord's will, shall be uh, worthy of many stripes. He's going to receive many stripes. Not only is a defiled garment person the one that did despite to the spirit of grace and quench the spirit of grace going to hell, they're going to get the greater damnation, like the Pharisees. Remember how Jesus said the Pharisees were going to get the greater damnation? He said, and that's because they were hypocrites. All through Matthew 23, he says, you hypocrites, you, your father the devil, you're hypocrites, you children of hell. You don't practice what you preach. You say the right things, and you say all the right stuff, but then you don't do. In fact, he says of the Pharisees, he says, they, they praise me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. And you can tell because of what they do. You can tell the tree by its fruit. Am I right? And so people are saying, uh, you know, I'm sealed by the Spirit, sealed by the Spirit. Well, hey, wait a minute. What about, where, where's the preacher telling you about, you better not grieve the Spirit and you better not quench the Spirit. Because how much worse punishment, suppose he, would he be thought worthy that he did to, to, the, the, blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite to the spirit of grace it's extremely huge problem we need to be extremely concerned about walking with the lord and walking in the holy spirit and not grieving the spirit and quenching the spirit and the best way you can not quench him and not grieve him is to not do the stuff he hates Okay, a dove is a clean bird. Okay, we remember the dove, right? It comes down like the Holy Spirit when Jesus is getting baptized. A dove is a clean bird. It won't land on like a dead carcass. It won't land on a stinking, rotting, filthy thing. Okay, it's a clean bird. You know, it's a... How's the Holy Spirit going to stay with you and stay with you and stay with you when you do filth after filth after filth right in front of Jesus in open rebellion? That's like Judas. You're you're like betraying the Lord, right? And it's, it's a huge problem. Um... 
And defiling your temple, right? If any man defile a temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Are you defiling your temple? Are there idols in your temple? Things, idols in your heart? And you're just going to walk up to the narrow gate. It's no problem, no problem. Saved by grace, saved by grace, sealed by the Spirit. It's no problem. I got idols in my pocket, but it's no problem. Now Paul said, what agreement does the temple of the Lord have with idols? None. Okay? Absolutely none. Let's keep going. Uh, Matthew 7, 13 and 14, talking about the narrow gate. And I'm here, to, I'm here to tell you, there really is a narrow gate. There really is a narrow gate. And... Uh, and get this, so let, there's two passages here. For Matthew 7, Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way to destruction, and many enter thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few find it. Uh, most people are familiar with that verse if you've been around church a while, but I'm here to tell you, um, if you don't walk the narrow path, you don't enter the narrow gate. You have to be on the narrow path, walk in the straight and narrow, with a daily cross of self-denial on your shoulder, you got to get up to the narrow gate you're going to be in good shape. That's who's coming in. But I'll tell you, um, here's the next verse. Watch out. Jesus in Luke 13, he says, strive to enter in at the, at the straight gate, right? The narrow gate. This is a different passage. He says, strive to enter in at the narrow gate for many, I say unto you, and this is Jesus. He's saying many, I'm telling you, many will try to enter in and will not be able. That's different. <coughs> What he's saying is, of the people that have that, that arrive at the narrow gate, some of them are not going to get in. And so, in fact, he says, many, many, I tell you, said the Lord Jesus, many, I tell you, will try to enter in and, and not be able. And this word, strive to enter, the Greek word for that is agonios, which is uh, agonize. Strive, agonize, strive to enter the narrow gate. Yearn for it. Because he's telling many, I tell you, will will try to enter in and not be able. What if you show up at the narrow gate? What if the, tonight's the night you die and suddenly you're standing in front of a narrow gate and you go to put your hand on the gate and it won't open for you? You will not be able to fix it. He's saying that's going to happen. Jesus, the Lord, is saying that's totally going to happen to a bunch of people where they're going to try to open that door and it doesn't open for them. And you won't be able to fix it then. We have to fix it now. While we're here right now, we need to cleanse our garment. We need to wash our robes in the blood of the Lamb. Um, and uh, and in fact, let's just get right in here. Uh, James 4, 8, and 9. We purify your hearts, you double-minded. Uh, afflict yourself and weep and mourn. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. You enjoy the heaviness. Now, when he says afflict yourself, you don't you don't flagellate yourself or whatever like that. That's a fast, okay? And, and Daniel and Daniel ten it says he he chastened himself with a fast. He chastised himself. He chastened himself with a fast. And you know, if you chasten yourself with a fast, you come up chaste. It's a cleansing thing that happens, and it's not just cleansing in your physical body, but it, it cleanses your heart and your your spirit. Um, going on going on a fast and chastening yourself uh, like Daniel did. And it's James 4, 8, and 9. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Are you double-minded? I have been. I've been a hypocrite. I've done all the stuff. I've done all the defiling my garment. And that's how I know the Lord corrected me. And he said, your garments are filthy. You're filthy in my sight, and you're not coming in. You're absolutely not coming in. I, I've walked with Jesus since I was a little boy and loved Jesus, but he let me know as, as directly as he could it wasn't happening. I needed to cleanse, and I needed to walk holy, or it's just not going to happen for him. I'm going to show up at the narrow gate and put my hand on the gate, and it's not going to open. Be afflicted and weep and mourn and let your laughter be turned to mourning. Okay, and that's James 4. Watch it. J uh, Jesus says the same thing in, in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Woe well, unto you that laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. This isn't a party. Okay, the, the daily cross of self-denial is not a party. You can't carry a cross without suffering. Jesus, Jesus said we're going to suffer persecution. In fact, says a we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. It's it's not it's hard to get into heaven. Um, the cross on your shoulder is not a party. It's your execution. We're going up the mountain to die. Okay, uh, Bonhoeffer said when Christ bids a man to come, he bids him to come and die. Jesus has called us to rend our heart uh, before God. This is like Joel 2.13. Rend your heart before God. Afflict yourself and weep and mourn. That is the solution. If you've been defiling your garment and you've been a Judas and you're betraying Jesus right in front of him and the record's going to show that you're a hypocrite that doesn't practice what they preach and you say that you're a follower of Jesus and you profess him with your lips but your heart is far from him because you're doing filth right in front of him, you need to rend your heart. You break your heart. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. Weep and mourn and let your laughter be turned to mourning. 
You can't. You don't get right with God just a high five prayer. Oh, high five, Lord. Sorry about that. Giggle. That's not how it works. He's not. That's not going to cut it. I mean, if you had, if you cheated on your spouse, you cheated on your wife, or you cheated on your husband, and he saw it, and you're found out and everything, and you needed him to forgive you, how much would you beg forgiveness? Okay, because you're the bride. You're supposed to be the spotless bride. You're, you're waiting for the wedding day, and you're off in the corner defiling yourself with the defiler, and you are found out. You can be sure your sins will find you out, and you're found out. We should be weeping and mourning. You've been betraying excellent, beautiful Jesus with the filth right in front of him. And it's all been recorded. This should be We should be horrified by that. Revelation 3, 5 says, He who overcomes to the end, his name shall I not blot out of the book of life. He's going to blot names out of the book of life. If this shows up even in Old Testament and Psalms and stuff, blotting their names out of the book. Um, what if that's you? What if you show up at judgment and they say, you know, is his name in the book of the life? And, and the angel says, no, his name's not in here. It was blotted out because you were doing filth on top of filth and you grieve the spirit and you quench the spirit that you, you were once sealed by. You quenched him and all of a sudden you're uh, you're striking out on judgment day. Jesus said it was totally going to happen. And they, you know what he said? These people are going to say, they're going to say, what are, you, what are you talking about, Lord? I, I ate and drank with you. You taught in our streets. I cast out demons in your name. I I, uh, I did all kinds of good stuff for you. I totally, obviously believed in you. And Jesus was going to say, you worker of iniquity. If you are a worker of iniquity, he is going to call you a worker of iniquity. And that is why Paul said, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. All of it. And tomorrow, depart from iniquity some more. Don't have anything going on in your life to where Jesus could say, you worker of iniquity. Because if he says it, he'll be right. If there's something that's going on in your life right now, you already know what it is. You burn it down in the name of Jesus Christ. You weep and mourn and fall on your face before him and you ask forgiveness and rend your heart. We should be horrified, terrified to be doing wrong things in the sight of Jesus and defiling your garment and defiling yourself and defiling your temple right in front of him. He sees it. Nothing is hid from the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Am I right? Don't show up at the narrow gate with no cross on your shoulder. We need to keep that cross on our shoulder, and that's self-denial. You want to do this, and you want to do that, and those works of the flesh, or your fornication, or your cheating, adultery, uh, dishonesty, whatever it is. But we deny that and say, no, I'm going to do it Jesus' way, even though it's going to hurt, even though it's going to cost me. Whatever it takes, whatever it costs, I'm going to obey Jesus, and it will cost you. To obey Jesus. Now, the preachers in church ain't telling you that today. Did you have any idea what you signed up for when you bent your knee before the throne of Jesus Christ? He owns you now. You only get to do what he says from now on. And and what he said is, you're appointed to suffering. Unto us, unto us has been given not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. And that's the cross on your shoulder. And that is the ball game you signed up for. And if you wilt and you, you falter and you go back to the world, like these names in Sardis, that the uh, they defiled their garment. They are not. They will not walk with Jesus and why? This whole thing's real. Heaven and hell's real. Jesus is real. And judgment day is coming. And judgment day is going to be a terrifying time. And there's tons of people that think they're okay with Jesus. And they're going to go show up on judgment day and get rejected. And that should terrify us all. What if that's you? A Hebrews 4.1 says, Let us therefore fear, lest after receiving a promise of entering into his rest, that any of us would come short of it. We're supposed to be concerned about that. And the preachers today are talking about, well, just relax, saved by grace. It's in the bag. It's guaranteed. Jesus is going to take care of it. You're pure no matter what you do. You're God's child no matter what you do or whatever like that. And the Bible is saying on every page, warning, warning, warning. You're in danger. Paul says, warn them that are unruly. Warn them. Warn them. You're not going to make it. Backslider, defiled garment. You're going to stand in front of Jesus with defiled garments and be naked and ashamed and try to explain to him how you're saved by grace and how you were sealed by the Spirit at one point? Is how you think that's going to cut it? Jesus says you work of iniquity. Boom, you're in the fire. That's that He told you it's going to happen. He told you and he sent you this message. You're listening to this right now. You will have no excuse. Nobody will have any excuses on judgment day. You either obeyed Jesus or you didn't and that's it. 
It's everyone according to their deeds, no respect of persons. And once you get your sins forgiven and you get the Holy Spirit, you need to get on that straight and narrow and get the cross on your shoulder and keep yourself pure and keep yourself garment clean and overcome to the end straight up. And if you're screwed up and messed up and backslidden or lukewarm or whatever it is, you need to fix it right now. Right now. You fix it and you cleanse and you fall on your face before the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, a couple more verses here and then I'm done. Uh, 1 John 2, 28, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. He, remember the ashamed, naked and ashamed. What if he bursts through the door for you and you're you're not ready? You're off in the corner defiling yourself with a defiler while you're waiting on the wedding day and he bursts through the door for you and he, he catches you with your pants down. Uh, let's just get right into this. Uh, there, there's a couple verses here that are very important. Uh, Luke 12, 35, there's a, remember he says, Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garment. He's talking about keeping watch and keeping your garment clean. Look here in Luke 12, he says, Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks that they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching and watch not only are they standing there watching keeping their post but at the beginning of the verse your loins girded about and your lights burning clean garment light shining bright standing watch blessed are those servants and he says it again and again here it is again mark 13 35 watch ye therefore for you know not when the master of the house cometh and now don't even worry about the rapture you can talk about all that stuff that's fine but uh it could be tonight he could come for you tonight. Uh, watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at evening or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say, Jesus says, uh, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. He's saying keep watch, keep watch, keep watch. Uh, he says it again and again. I want to tell you, uh, people that say... Um, uh, their garment, there's people that say that their garment is clean no matter what and everything, but check it out. In 2 Peter, uh, he's, he's saying, The dog is, is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. If you were washed, and you Jesus cleansed you of all your sins, and you were washed and everything, and it's a beautiful, wonderful moment in your life, that's great. But if you go back to doing the filth, and you return, you're, it's, remember the sow that was washed. It was washed, but now it's back in the filth again. That's not going to fly. When Jesus washes you and everything, he says, now you need to keep yourself pure. Don't go back to doing the filth. Dear Lord Jesus, don't go back to doing that filth. If you have gone back to doing the filth and the dishonesty and the sexual sin, you are not washed anymore. You're like a, the dog returned to his vomit and the pig that was washed is back in the filth. You better get out of that filth and you get clean and you fall on your face before Jesus and beg for him to cleanse you and forgive you. You know, people don't like this, but check it out. In 1 Timothy, Paul says, Them that sin rebuke before all so that others may fear. If you're sinning, you need to be rebuked right in front of everybody. Okay, in Titus 1.13, Paul says, Wherefore, rebuke them sharply so that they would be sound in the faith. I don't want to run folks off into hell, but I will do, give you a sharp rebuke. Paul said to do it. Paul says, exhort one another while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I want to tell you, I mentioned it in 1 Corinthians where he says, uh, any man that's called a brother that's a fornicator or covetous or a drunker or a cheater, not to even eat, put away from yourselves uh, that wicked person. We're not supposed to, if you're doing filth like fornication, dishonesty, you're, the brethren are supposed to be rejecting you and kicking you out of the brethren and saying, no, you need to get right. Now watch out, it says, um, uh, if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Uh, and so we need to be able to admonish one another. And I'm here to admonish you today. I'm here to exhort you today, lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Dear Lord Jesus, don't be caught with a defiled garment in the name of Jesus. Don't be caught with a defiled garment on judgment day. Please, please cleanse. Please get the sin out of your life. I'm begging you. I'm begging you to burn it down. I don't care what it is. Don't you touch that person one more time. 
Don't you commit that dishonesty one more time. And I don't care if you have to quit your job or lose your job. And I don't care if you become homeless. And I don't be care if you have to be care if you have to be celibate for the rest of your life. You do it. You do whatever you have to do to make sure that you don't fail in front of Jesus naked and ashamed because you're a worker of iniquity. Do not be a worker of iniquity. Let everyone in the name of that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. I beg you. I beg you. I beg you. Depart from iniquity. People that don't practice what they preach, the hypocrites are not going to make it. You have to be legit. You have to be pure. The spotless bride can't be having spots and blemishes. Okay, you keep your garment clean. I'm going to wrap it up with this verse right here. Watch this. Revelations 19.8. And to her was granted, this is talking about the bride. Uh, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Your words and deeds will clothe you. You can defile your temple with evil words and deeds, and you can keep it clean with graceful words and graceful deeds. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Your words and deeds are clothing you. How's your garment? How is your garment? Is your garment clean? Are you naked and ashamed before God? You need to fix it. You need to get it right. Don't let any preacher lie to you and tell you some flim-flam nonsense that it's safe, and it's in the bag, and it's guaranteed, and you don't need to fear God anymore. Fear God. Fear God harder. Fear God harder. Let us therefore fear. Lest any of us could come short of it, we're supposed to be concerned about it. If there's anything in your life that could cause you to be called the worker of iniquity on Judgment Day, burn it down in the name of Jesus. Burn it down in the fear of God right now. You can't patch up your prayer life on your Judgment Day, and you can't fix it on Judgment Day. you got to fix it now. I'm begging you. Don't be God's cursed children that have forsaken the right way and gone astray. I'm begging you in the name of Jesus. I'm begging you. Cleanse your garment. Cleanse your heart. Rend your heart. Cleanse your life. Burn it down. Burn it down. Burn down anything. It's dung. Paul said, I've suffered the loss of all things and I count it, but dung that I may gain Christ. Burn it down. It's dung that you may gain Christ. Anything that's standing in between you, anything that's going on that he hates, get it out of there right now. Don't let these preachers lie to you and don't lie to yourself. You can talk about sealed by the Spirit all day long. I'm sealed by the Spirit. I'm sealed by the Spirit. But you grieve the Spirit and you quench the Spirit and you're going to get blown out on Judgment Day with defiled garments and you heard it here. You will have no excuse on Judgment Day. You heard the warning. I love you. I love you so much. Please don't let this happen to you. Jesus said it's going to happen to a bunch of people. Don't let it happen to you. Please, please. He said it's going to happen to a bunch of people. He sent this warning to you. Hear the warning. Heed the warning. Burn it down in the fear of God. I beg you. I love you. I love you all. Thank you, Jesus.